Okay, the purpose of this video is to introduce the idea of pole zero plots. Pole zero plots are really a helpful way to conceptually understand what goes on in terms of uh, uh, the transfer function of a system or in terms of uh, the inverse Laplace transform of a function. So in a pole zero plot, we typically assume that we have a ratio of two polynomials. So I'll call this n for numerator and d for denominator. And this might be uh, the ratio of two polynomials that we get when we get a, uh, a uh, transfer function or the ratio of two polynomials that we get when we're trying to invert a Laplace transform. It turns out that it uh, doesn't really matter. And to illustrate the idea behind pole zero plots, let me actually just put in a couple of, of numbers or polynomials. Let's suppose, for the sake of example, that our numerator is s plus 1 and our denominator is s over s squared. Or I'm sorry, is s times s squared plus 4s plus 13. Okay. And it turns out that the roots of the numerator, that is the values of s that make the numerator 0, there's only one and it's equal to minus 1. The roots of the denominator, or the values of s that make the denominator 0, is 0 minus 2 plus j3. So this guy here has complex roots. And minus 2 minus j3. Okay. And it turns out that the location of these roots of the numerator and denominator polynomials are extremely important. Uh, in particular, the roots of the denominator polynomial tell us the sorts of time functions that are going to show up in an inverse Laplace transform. Um, so to introduce some notation and explain why, we call the roots of the numerator zeros. And we call the roots of the denominator poles. And let me explain why, why we do that. Um, what I've done is I've plotted the uh, magnitude of this polynomial as a function of s. So again, uh, s is complex, which means that the polynomial, if I evaluate it, at any point in the complex plane is going to give me a complex value. And what I've done is computed the uh, amplitude or the magnitude of that complex value at, at different points in the complex plane. And when you compute that and plot it, you get something that looks like this. So let's see if we can actually get this guy to show up. There it is. Oops, that's not quite what I had in mind. Let's move this around a little bit. Okay, so again, what we have here is we have the magnitude of this polynomial at every point in the complex plane. You might not be able to see the axes down here. This is the real values, and these are the imaginary values. And so for every real and imaginary value, we've found the value of the polynomial and taken its magnitude. So um, at the risk of uglifying this beautiful graph here, the real axis goes through something like this. Okay, so it goes through this mountain here. So this is... the real axis, and the imaginary axis goes again through this mountain. So this is the imaginary. Okay. And these mountains, actually we call them poles, but these, these things that poke up are poking up wherever the denominator of our polynomial is 0. 
So you'll remember we had a root of the polynomial at 0, which is this point right here. And you can see that we've got this, this the, the magnitude of the uh, function gets very big. And in fact, if MATLAB were capable of plotting it, it the magnitude of the function at 0 goes off to infinity. And also, over here, at a value of um, minus 2, minus 3, j, we have another pole, which again is another 0 of the denominator. And at minus 2 plus 3j, we have another pole, which again is another 0 of the denominator. So that's why they're called poles, is because in the plot of the magnitude, of the uh, uh, polynomial, uh, they go off to infinity. It's kind of hard to see, so we'll bring up the actual plot and turn it around a little bit. If you look at minus 1, the real part of minus 1, 0, in fact, maybe if we look at it side on, you can see that at minus 1, 0, so it's a real part of minus 1 and an imaginary part of 0, that the function goes to 0. And if we spin this guy around like this and look at it from the imaginary axis, again you can see that the lowest point in the plot is where the at minus 1, 0, and that's a 0. That's actually a root of the numerator polynomial. So that's why we call them poles and zeros. Okay, so hopefully the reason why we do this is now clear. So let's clean up a little bit and talk a little bit about poles and zeros. Okay, um, again, whenever we have something where we have a numerator polynomial over a denominator polynomial, the roots or poles of the denominator polynomial give us terms in a partial fraction expansion. So when we're taking the inverse Laplace transform of something that looks like this, n over s, or n of s over d of s, then each root of d of s gives us a term in a partial fraction expansion. And um, so again, if we look back at the uh, example polynomial, we have s plus 1 over s times s squared plus 4s plus 13, and this has roots of 0, minus 2 plus j3, 2 plus j3. So when I take the partial fraction expansion of this polynomial, I'm going to have some constant over s minus this root 0, which is s, plus another constant k2 over s minus the next root, which would be plus 2 minus j3, plus k3 over s plus 2 plus j3. So again, everywhere I have a root, which we also call a pole, I have a term in, a partial in the partial fraction expansion. And hopefully, by now, you understand the idea that each of these things um, has an inverse Laplace transform. This inverse Laplace transform is k of t, u of t. The inverse Laplace transform of these two guys together is going to be an e to the minus 2t and then, well, one way to write it, which hopefully isn't too confusing, is cosine of 3t plus a phase term. And I fear that this may actually be more confusing. Um, the idea is that the imaginary part here gives us the frequency of a sinusoid, and the constants k2 and k3 will tell us uh, whether the sinusoid is a cosine or a sine or some combination of a cosine and a sine. Okay, and for now we're not going to worry about whether it's a cosine or a sine. We just know that it has some sort of sinusoidal thing that wiggles. 
and uh, it turns out that we can look at these things in terms of just a plot on the complex plane. Okay, so I have the real axis and the imaginary axis. Okay, I have this pole at zero, and that corresponds to a unit step function. So I can actually plot something at zero and poles we plot with an x. I also have a pole at minus 2 plus j3. So over here at minus 2 up by j3 I have a pole and at 2 whoops that should have been minus 2 minus j3. Oh that's awful. Okay minus 2 minus j3 I have another pole down here. Okay and I know that this pole at zero, this guy corresponds to a unit step function. I know that these two guys at minus 2 plus j3 and minus 2 minus j3, these guys correspond to something that decays exponentially and wiggles, whoops, and wiggles with a frequency of about 3, well of exactly 3. So the point I'm trying to make here is that by looking at where the poles are in the complex plane at the origin uh, with a particular real and imaginary part, that tells me quite a bit about the sorts of things I can expect to see. So a pole at the origin corresponds to a unit step function. Uh, a pair of poles with a negative real and an imaginary part that's either plus or minus 3 in this case corresponds to a decaying, an exponentially decaying sinusoid. Okay, so it looks like this video has actually gotten sort of long so what I'll do is I'll stop here and then in the next video we'll generalize what we've discovered about poles and zeros.